Okay, welcome to video six. We are going to start looking at contemporary issues concerning family law. You will see on page 66, you have two red boxes. The top red box is identify and investigate these contemporary issues relating to family law. The second red box is evaluate the effectiveness of legal and non-legal responses to these issues. Okay, so we're doing the same thing for all of our contemporary issues. This video is going to look at the recognition of same-sex relationships and the changing nature of parental responsibility. Okay, so when it comes to recognition of same-sex relationships, we'll start with the Marriage Act of 1961. <sighs> and quite a few states have discriminated against couples in same-sex relationships by giving rights to heterosexual couples that were not given to same-sex couples. The strange part of this has always been that state and Commonwealth legislation, for example, the Sex Discrimination Act of 1984, made this kind of discrimination generally illegal, but the lawmakers still allowed for unequal rights. This is not and was not just a historical problem. In 2001, countries around the world started allowing same-sex marriage. Countries like the Netherlands, Spain, Canada, etc. Oh, here we go. That little gay panic coming up. Okay. I'm sorry, gay panic. This made conservative politicians in the United States and Australia worried about, uh-oh, we might be next. The gay thing. So in 2004, little Johnny Howard's government passed the Marriage Amendment Act to include a definition of marriage in Section 5.1 of the Marriage Act. The purpose of this law was to make sure that marriage in Australia only included marriage between a man and a woman. Two Marriage Amendment Bills, 2012, to change this, failed in the Parliament. I think I've told you guys before, when I got married in 2008, I asked my wedding celebrant to mumble that line. It actually was a line that had to officially be part of any marriage ceremony that marriage is between a man and a woman. I had um, some same-sex couples at my wedding who are friends and family members and while I wanted my wedding to be legal, the line had to be said, but I didn't want them, my friends or family members to be offended by it. So I asked very kindly if he would just mumble that line a little bit. Marriage between a woman and a woman and a little bit. Okay. Legal responses. In 1999, the New South Wales government passed the Property Relationships Legislation Amendment Act 1999 to change the old de facto relationship act of 84 to include same-sex couples as being counted as de facto couples. Good work. This law was then known as the Property Relationships Act. I don't know why they changed the name, but left the year either. Eh, that'd be weird. Note three, it doesn't really matter because the Commonwealth Government now deals with de facto couples, financial and property matters. But hey, in 1991, New South Wales got on board to do the right thing. Since 2000, laws have been passed at Commonwealth and state levels to recognise same-sex relationships. In 2007, the same-sex, same entitlements Human Rights Commission, 2007. Okay, it put out a report, inconveniently for the people who said, find me one example of discrimination, um, outlining the enormous number of laws that continue to discriminate against same-sex couples. In 2008, the government, Commonwealth Government passed the Same-Sex Relationship Equal Treatment in Commonwealth Laws General Law Reform Act to amend 84 Commonwealth laws to remove discrimination against same-sex couples. The Commonwealth Government also passed the Family Law Amendment De Facto Financial and Other Measures Act in 2008 to allow property and maintenance cases of separating same-sex de facto couples the ability to have their cases heard in the family court. 
In New South Wales, the government passed the Miscellaneous Acts Amendment, Same Sex Relationship Act, to give female same sex couples the ability to have both mothers' names on their child's birth certificate. And these things are good. When it says at the top there that um, a law was passed, same sex relationships equal treatment in Commonwealth laws. Um, some of the ways that same sex couples were discriminated against were um, being able to access their partner's superannuation if they passed on, um, being recognised as a partner when it came to making um, medical decisions over um, blood family members um, stepping in and saying, you know, you're gay, I don't like you, you're not married, bugger off, you can't visit your partner in hospital and we'll be making decisions. Like there was a lot of discrimination going on. In, 2000, in 2009, the Greens tried to get the Marriage Equality Amendment Bill 2009 passed, but neither of the major political parties supported the bill and it was defeated in the Senate in 2010. In 2010, the New South Wales government allowed MPs to have a conscience vote on allowing gay adoption. I think I've talked about conscience votes to you before. So instead of going, oh, well, I'm in the Liberal Party and the Liberal Party line is, we all say no, so I have to say no. I don't have to listen to the party line. I go, in my heart, in my conscience, what do I think the right thing is? And I will vote that way. Okay, so we had a conscience vote on allowing gay adoption. This was the Adoption Amendment Same-Sex Couple Act of 2010. It was passed with an exception that religious adoption agencies are still allowed to discriminate against same-sex couples. Choosing someone you personally. 2011. Oh, Fred, 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 Fred. You've met Fred. The leader of the Christian Democrats, Fred Nile, introduced a bill into the New South Wales Legislative Council to try and repeal the changes in the law, Adoption Amendment Same Sex Couple Repeals Bill 2011. It wasn't passed though. That is a good thing. It is good that a very narrow minded Christian view of what a family should look like was um, not something that the rest of the government agreed with. Fred Nile, look him up. He's a treasure. Not. Okay, in 2012, two marriage amendment bills failed in the Commonwealth Parliament. In 2013, the New South Wales government ordered a parliamentary inquiry into same sex marriage in New South Wales. The final report argued that the New South Wales government had the power to pass a gay marriage law, but that it might end up getting challenged in the High Court. The Premier decided not to pass a law. That was his idea in the first place because he didn't have the courage to uh, face up to a High Court challenge. Still in 2013, the Australian Capital Territory did pass the Marriage Equality Same Sex Act, thinking that the federal government was not allowed under the constitution to pass laws about same sex marriage. Okay, so this is coming down to the old idea of division of power. The federal government can do some stuff, the state government can do some stuff, and there's a little area in between where they intersect. And the way that the states and the Australian Capital Territory look read those division of powers, it appeared that they had the legal ability to make their own laws around marriage. But the High Court decided in the Commonwealth of Australia versus the ACT that the ACT was wrong. So, nope, you can't have it. So for a little while in 2013, it was believed that it was going to be legal to have um, same-sex marriages performed in Canberra, the ACT, and that they'd be legal, but no, the High Court nixed it. What the High Court decided was that the Commonwealth Government already had an act that covers all marriages in Australia, which banned gay marriage because it had that wording, marriages between a man and a woman. They also found that the ACT could not operate concurrently with that law, so the ACT's 
law about same-sex marriage couldn't happen at the same time as the federal law which said no gay marriage because it would clash. So the ACT Act was deemed to be completely invalid. In 2015, the government decided to spend some money and have a referendum about same-sex marriage. But then someone pointed out, there's no need for a referendum because you can only have a referendum to change something in the constitution and you don't need to change the constitution for parliament to allow same-sex marriage. They just need to pass a normal law. So that's when they went, oh, we'll have a plebiscite then. So all Australia could just tell Parliament directly how they wanted their MPs to vote. But then some members of Parliament realised that even if 100% of Australians voted yes, the MPs could just refuse to follow it because, as I've talked about the plebiscite before in the past, it's just a very, 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 very expensive survey. A referendum, what is decided from a referendum, so, for example, should Aboriginal people be recognised as citizens of Australia? Vote yes or no. Whatever those votes came in, that was it. That The decision had been made and the, that law would be changed based on that decision. With a plebiscite, should we allow gay marriage? Yes or no. All the votes come in and then yes, 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 yes. And I go, well... I'm the member for Tarbuck Bay and I reckon that's book crap, so I'm going to vote no anyway. So, again, a very expensive survey that had no real power. And, oh, there is some stuff on the next next slide, so I'll, I'll save the rest of my stories. Oh. Okay, so I've got two clips attached here, I did forget about these, that look at the plebiscite and, and what it actually means and look it is really interesting really fascinating and it's um yeah well worth your time to have a look at those two clips passing forward in 2017 okay all right so 2015 they're going oh yeah little, little, little. maybe we'll do that in 2017 the government actually decided on a voluntary non-binding postal plebiscite so they've been thinking about it for a couple of years and then they've gone, all right, let's do it. So it's voluntary, so I'm going to send this out to every single house in Australia, but if you don't feel like voting for it, you don't have to worry about it. Like, you know, the gays aren't your concern, don't worry about it. Again, non-binding, plebiscite, went out the post. It wasn't even certain whether it was legal, so it was decided that it should be cha challenged in the High Court. The High Court decided that this was, a, this was legal, specifically because it was only a survey, which the ABS is entitled to do, that is the Australian Bureau of Statistics. This led to a lot of foreseeable problems, basically turning one third of the population against the other two thirds. There were protests, there was nasty advertising, and the result when it did come in was 61.6% .6 of all Australians voted yes to gay marriage and 38.4% voted no. It was a clear recognition of support for marriage equality, but created new problems of having millions of people now feeling like victims and fighting for the right to discriminate based on religious grounds. The government then ordered a Liberal-led review of religious freedoms in hope of delaying completely equal rights for gay couples. Um, let me see what's on the next page. And well, uh, before I get into those religious freedoms, let's just have a look at those percentage figures. 61.6 to 38.4. Prior to the plebiscite, there had been a number of um, surveying of the general community and public as to their thoughts and feelings on same-sex marriage. And pretty much they're the exact same statistical data that they got from a variety of other different ways that they... Um, polled the you know, the people like you know, do you agree or not agree they basically didn't have to spend a good jillion dollars on this non-binding voluntary post postal plebiscite if parliamentarians had just been listening to their constituents as is supposed to be their job all along they basically had access to those same types of figures 
Okay, so let's look at 2017, the Marriage Amendment Definition and Religious Freedoms Act of 2017 was actually passed. So what changed? So subsection 5, one definition of marriage, omit, that means remove, take away a man and a woman and substitute the terms two people. So a marriage occurs between two people instead of a marriage occurs between a man and a woman. Um, okay, 47 ministers of religion, oh, section 47, ministers of religion may refuse to solemnise marriages. So a, a church, church doesn't necessarily have to marry anyone if they don't want to. Like if I walked into a, I don't know, some rando church somewhere that I wasn't a member of their um, congregation, I wasn't of that particular faith or denomination if that church or priest went huh no I don't know you and I I don't want to marry you. that's fine well within their rights but there were 40 so you know ministers have always had the right to refuse to solemnize marriages they've never had to solemnize marriages but um it, it's it's hmm. No, actually, I don't know. My brain just turned to, to dust then. So essentially, these things already existed. But um, some people saw the introduction of gay marriage as um, a, a good reason to understand and know that they had the right to say no. Okay. Uh, Section 47A, religious marriage celebrants may refuse to solemnise marriage. Again, they could always refuse anyway. It's not like yeah, they have to take your business. 47b bodies established for religious purposes may refuse to make facilities available or provide goods or services again i might try to rent out a room somewhere and they decide that they just don't like me and say no and so like these rights already existed but when you think about the sex discrimination acts that actually do exist in this country if you are using you know someone's sexual preference as the basis of your reason to say no to stop them from being um, sued or charged as such they're covered already the religious freedoms part was to anyway, make sure that people like priests wouldn't be forced to marry gay couples, whatever. But it went further to make a protected category of religious marriage celebrants who are people who aren't priests but want to discriminate in the same way, who could also refuse gay couples. Like I said, you can always refuse this stuff anyway. Uh, Section 47B is the infamous do religious bakers have to make bake gay cakes for gay weddings section. The answer. Anybody could always refuse to bake a cake, as I was saying before. This section really only covers a body that was established specifically for religious purposes. I can go to a bakery and ask, can you please make me a cake that has something rude on it? And I can go, no, that's not what we do. They've always been able to say no. But um, people needed to feel that they were within the right Okay, No. Your marriage goes against my religious freedom, so I'm not going to do it. It just gave them a little soapbox to stand on. I think that's what I was trying to say before. Okay, let's look at our non-legal responses. There have been responses by NGOs and the media on both sides of the debate to give same-sex couples greater legal recognition. We have pro-same-sex rights, groups like Australian Marriage Equality and the Gay and Lesbian Rights Lobby, have always argued for marriage rights for same-sex couples. And we have anti-same-sex rights. Most of the powerful groups that fight against the recognition of same-sex relationships are religious groups, for example, the Australian Christian Lobby. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer there, really. All right, so we did have some big campaigns around the plebiscite. We had the No campaign. The Coalition for Marriage wants you to know you can say no. The Coalition for Marriage, which essentially is the Australian Christian Lobby, amongst about 80 other groups that were against same-sex marriage, had ads with mums on screen saying things like, in countries with gay marriage, parents have lost their right to choose. 
they also brought in politicians and former politicians like little Johnny Howard, who was afraid of the gays, to make the argument that you have a right to choose. Kind of like cigarette companies, like, you know, you can smoke or not smoke. You can not have the gays being allowed in the club. <laughs> Your freedom is at risk if you give other people freedom. Maybe they'll do to you what you've done to them. Oh, my gosh, maybe they'll discriminate against you. Um, the Yes campaign. Oh, sorry, the same-sex marriage plebiscite led to some very desperate campaigning on both sides, so that was the No campaign. Here is the Yes campaign. The Equality campaign. Australian marriage equality, get up, and about 1,300 small community groups focused on social media and getting people to talk about the issue. Okay, I'm going to lean into the computer so I can read the little poster here. Okay, so we have a gentleman on the left who is wearing a suit and he seems to have some military medals pinned in. We can make the ultimate sacrifice, but we can't make the ultimate commitment. So soldiers can be gay and go and serve for their country and die, but they're not allowed to marry the person they love. The middle image is somebody wearing hospital scrubs with a stethoscope around their neck and a face mask below their chin. These days it'll be over their nose. Okay, we can hold a life in our hands, but we can't ask for our partner's hand. And our last image on the right is our red and gold bronze Aussie surf lifesaver. We can leap to your aid, but we can't take the plunge. So essentially the campaign shows the funny consequence of fact that there was a plebiscite, hang on, the funny consequence of the fact that there was a plebiscite, bleh, 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 bleh. oh, bugger that. Sorry, let me get back to talking about the ad. That's it, it's made no sense. Um, it was saying we can put our, our lives on the line. You need, you know, you need, people doing these jobs to you know, help the world go forward and yet on my in my personal life I'm being treated as less than. I'm fighting for you and our country. I am saving your lives, but I'm not allowed to live my life in a free and happy way. All right, back to that sentence I was trying to read. A funny consequence of the fact that there was a plebiscite was that you could only give your opinion if you were a registered voter. So what happened? A record number of young people suddenly got off their butts and got onto the electoral roll. 90,000 new voters enrolled for marriage equality survey. Good on you young people, it's good to know that you are willing to participate in the world rather than just watch it roll by. Okay, let's have a look at evaluating. Evaluate the effectiveness of legal and non-legal responses to these issues. In order for the law to actually change, a significant number of politicians must be willing to change the law, even if it is unpopular with some powerful groups. The courts have to be willing to change, oh sorry, willing to act to interpret the law in favour of change. And the rest of society must be willing to support the changes by not voting in a government who promises to repeal the changes. So let's say it all went through 2017. Who was in charge then? Honestly, I can't even remember if it was a Labour or a Liberal government in 2017, let alone what I had for lunch yesterday. So let's just pretend hmm, it was the... Pink Pen Party. Oh, hang on. Ooh, there it is. Pink Pen. Okay, so the Pink Pen Party is in charge, and we changed the law so we can have gay marriage. Yay! And then next year there's an election, and everybody voted for. Ooh, um, <laughs> the Coaster Party. So, Pink Pen Party's out. Coaster Party is now the boss. They go. Hmm. Or well, one of the things we told you we were going to do was we're going to get rid of that same-sex marriage law. So it's gone. Okay, so society, as we already know, supported same-sex marriage. More than a third of the Australian population voted for same-sex marriage. But if people uh, <coughs> were unhappy with it, they would have voted in a party that was going to get rid of the law. 
Okay, we're going to look at legal responses, effective and ineffective. So our effective legal responses here. There's been increased equality in terms of same-sex couple rights. So for example, we have de facto rights now in, um, that now include same-sex couples. The legal system is more accessible to same-sex couples, that is same-sex couples being able to have their relationship breakdown dealt with by family court. Um, the creation of agencies that deal with discrimination against same-sex couples, a parliamentary inquiry into same-sex marriage in New South Wales, ask the public for their views. The voluntary postal plebiscite ended up with 61.6% .6 of people voting yes. The Marriage Amendment Act of 2017 was passed. Okay, I just had to go and make a cup of tea. I had a coughing bit. Um, all right, ineffective legal responses. <clears throat> Little Johnny Howard went, oh my God, oh my God, the gays are coming and passed the Marriage Amendment Act in 2004, putting in that actual phrasing and terminology that a marriage is defined as being only between a man and a woman. And remember, we are talking about relationship of same-sex marriages, so that's very ineffective. Um, the Rudd-Gillard government, that's a Labor government, the Howard government was a Liberal one, they actually decided not to allow um, for a debate on the issue of gay marriage. Remembering a politician's job is to stay popular, they thought that it was not an issue that the majority of Australians wanted to discuss as such and they wanted to continue being re-elected and keep their jobs. So they thought, oh, nah, don't want to talk about it. Even Obama, um, when he was first in power, didn't want to get into the gay marriage debate because of you know the fear of it possibly being an unpopular opinion and losing votes. <clears throat> the marriage amendment bills of 2012 couldn't even get through one house of parliament when you know, some people were trying to make changes. The Commonwealth of Australia versus the ACT case found um, the ACT's Marriage Equality Same-Sex Act was invalid. Oh, this bit. Okay, effective non-legal responses. <clears throat> okay, the Law Reform Commission and the Australian Human Rights Commission identified areas of law where same-sex relationships were not being recognised when it came to health, insurance, government benefits, etc., and re recommended changes to the government which have then been made into law. So, yay, these non-elite, these NGOs, non-government, yeah, non-government, non-legal people went out and went, let's look at the issue. Hey, government, this is what we found. The government, oh yeah, better fix that. So, yay, very effective. Some parts of the media, as well as NGOs representing gay rights, made an issue that directly affects only a minority of the population a major issue for politicians to deal with. Remember, if the people are talking about it, politicians have to become concerned because their job is to stay popular. If the issue is popular, it's like, oh, OK, we better get on the right side of this and move forward. The equality campaign was successful when it did come to the actual plebiscite. Remember, they put together those ads showing our um, services, our doctors, nurses, our lifesavers, people we rely upon for our safety, not being allowed to live a full life. So, yay, successful campaign. Ineffective non-legal responses. Oh, jeebus. Nope, yep. The power of the Australian Christian lobby and other religious groups, including their level of influence in the media, has influenced public opinion for a long time, with some poor arguments such as, oh God, it's been so long since I've heard God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, which is really an argument against allowing homosexual sex and adoption, since the theoretical Adam and Eve weren't married and the question wasn't about kids. That and the other one is that people should have the right to not follow the law because they personally disagree based on the grounds that God said so. So imagine if all these people, God said so, so all right, God said so, so. What, you cheated on your wife? Let's stone him to death. Um, sorry, just thinking about this just makes me think of the anti-vaxxers, anti-maskers protests give us back our freedom to infect people because well, I don't want to follow the law because um yeah nah. anyway 
Sorry, my brother's been getting on social media saying some real crackpot stuff. Okay, so I have linked for you 28 minutes and 38 seconds having a listen about the Tunin case. Um, you might remember Tunin from Human Rights. Um, this is where uh, the Victorian, a Tasmanian gentleman looked at the laws around homosexuality that still existed and sought to have them removed. Um, good case, one that you can use in a lot of different places. I've also linked just to the end of this section about same-sex um, relationships. The Tasmania makes gender optional on birth certificates after Liberal crosses the floor. Honestly, I cannot remember if this is an article or a clip, but I will link it for you. Um, this is 2019 that this came out. This is you know, two years after we went yes to same-sex marriage. But um, gender identification is not always related to same-sex relationships, but it is in the same boat. It is a contemporary issue. There are many forms now where you have the option to tick male, female, or prefer not to say. Um, people identify as non-binary. And, you know, some more progressive type thinkers aren't comfortable with raising their children from birth in, okay, let's just say as, as pink or blue, but more allowing the child just to be a child and for them to make decisions about how they see themselves and their sexuality, their gender, as they become older and find their own sense of identity and you know it might be seen as you know somewhat crackpot by some but at the same time I'd much rather just you know say hey I'm a butterfly than someone told me my entire life I'm you know you're a caterpillar so you know good things all right moving on okay this is our second contemporary right we are on page 74 of your workbooks now. And this looks at the changing nature of parental responsibilities. So in the past, parents fought for custody and control over their children. The law was based on parental rights. Now the courts are much less concerned with parental rights and are much more concerned with parental responsibility. The focus of the law is on making sure that parents fulfill their legal obligations towards their children. Parents have joint responsibility towards their children. This comes under the Family Law Act, sections 61B and C. This applies equally to children born within a marriage and ex-nuptial children, so children that are born outside of a marriage. Reforms of family law have more recently been based around ensuring that both parents share responsibility more equally and that children have that right to a meaningful relationship with both parents. The 2006 reforms were all about shared parental responsibility. Parents were already expected to share responsibility for their children after the breakdown of a relationship, but the reality was in fact different. Fathers groups were concerned that judges were not applying the law as it was intended, and there was a perception that judges in general applied the 80-20 rule, which is what I mentioned briefly earlier, meaning it's generally assumed that unless there was abuse or neglect involved. The children would spend time with their dad every second weekend, Father's Day, hey, that's today, and you know, split the holidays, you know, Christmas this year with mum, Christmas next year with dad, Easter with the opposite, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> the changes. Hmm. I think there's something before that. Aha, uh -huh, yes, the changes were intended to bring balance back to the system. But the wording of the law and some of the provisions actually created some problems. In his evaluation, former family court judge Richard Chisholm argued that the changes to the Family Law Act were probably needed to emphasise the fact that both parents are responsible for their children. But the way the Act was drafted or written went too far in the other direction. 
rather than bring balance, the change has led to a situation where the law needs to be reformed. Once again, to clarify the idea of shared parental responsibility. Under the law, we all have rights, but we also have responsibilities. So as an individual, I have the right to free speech, but I have the responsibility to um, not stand on a boxer and make hate-filled rhetoric that discriminates against people. I have the right to free speech, but I have the responsibility not to be an a-hole. So let's have a good look at shared parental responsibility. Shared parental responsibility equals sharing responsibility for making major decisions in your child's life. Shared care equals spending equal time with both parents. So it's not about parental rights, you know, I've got the right to make all the decisions for my child's life, I've got the right to spend time with them. It's as a parent, I have a responsibility to be part of the decision making process that's going to affect my kid. As a parent, I have the responsibility to make sure that my child has the opportunity to form a relationship with both their parents. It's responsibility, not rights. Okay, so the key mistake that has been made is that the idea of shared parental responsibility has been misinterpreted to mean 50-50 time. This has caused a great level of conflict as parents fight for their, oh, they're fighting for their rights again, fight for their rights rather than taking care of the best interests of the child. There has also been the insertion of the requirement that the judge must consider equal time when practical. Practicable? Practical? Practicable. Huh. Not sure if that's a real word. When practical works just as well if practicable is not one. Okay, the position on the meaningful relationship principle. Above the protection from harm section in the Family Law Act led fathers and some lawyers and judges to read the law as meaning shared parental responsibility is equals equal time. This is not accurate. This is really difficult to make work in real life situations. Let me just check. Um, okay, I'm not sure if I talk about this more specifically coming up, so let's just have a quick think for a minute. So the 50-50 rule. Okay, so let's say, uh, let's look at our, our school week. So week A, you live at mum's, week B, you live at dad's. Week A at mum's, week B at dad's, blah, 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 back and forth, 50 50 split. That means maintaining two households. Um, you then have the situations which arise all the time. I see it now, even as a teacher. Oh, I've left that book at mum's place. Oh, I'm not going back to dad's place till such and such time. I've left that there. It, that can be really disruptive for a child. Um, they might not have, you know, access, let's say yeah, mum's got a computer and dad doesn't, so I'm staying at dad's this week so I can't do my assessment, miss. Okay, so that 50-50 can cause a lot more problems than good, particularly for kids, because if you're, you're packing a bag back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, living out of a suitcase, that's not necessarily going to lead to a child feeling, you know, safe and stable in their home environment so that's part of the problem when we go oh yeah that must mean 50 50 time all right moving on <clears throat> hmm. the main legal reforms oh we're up to evaluating we're going to evaluate the effectiveness of legal and non-legal all right so the main legal reforms can be seen as the 2006 reforms and the 2011 fixes to those reforms so we looked at at that earlier where we went from you know um, meaningful relationship being the most important thing to uh, caring for the safety of kids is the most important thing so you don't insist on a meaningful relationship if one of the parental units is abusive okay <sighs> so the family law legislation family violence and other measures act of 2011 
also known as the Family Violence Act, made the protection from harm principle more important that the child than, which would be than, than the child having a meaningful relationship with both parents. It widened the definition of abuse. So instead of just the child being abused personally, um, it added the idea of them being exposed to domestic violence as being a form of violence itself. So seeing or hearing mum being abused um, was considered as you know, the child being a victim of abuse. They also repealed or removed that friendly parent provision and they removed the false allegation provision. We did talk about all that earlier on. So go back in your notes and check if you don't know or don't remember about that. Oh, I leaned towards that using my clicker. Uh, click, click. The non-legal responses to the changing nature of parental responsibilities. Here we go. Uh, have included the following. Church-based organisations provide support, counselling, education and skills programs to ensure that parents are better able to fulfil their responsibility as parents, both during their relationship or after the breakdown of their relationship with their partner, for example, Anglicare. So essentially there are organisations that are out there helping parents to be better parents and there are some people that you need to learn to go to school to learn how to be a good parent. And so the fact that these organisations are there to help is great. Relationships Australia provides services, for example, family dispute resolution, to make sure that separating parents are aware of their responsibilities and that those responsibilities are to be shared. So it helps parents to understand the law and what's going on. Non-government organisations that represent the interests of certain groups also provide information and legal assistance to make sure that the people that they represent are given the right to fully participate in decision making that affects their children. For example, the National Council of Women of Australia or GADSLINK. Okay, so we're going to look at the issue that most students don't raise. When we talk about parental responsibility, we're usually only talking about it after separation. Take these real orders from a 2016 case. Okay. Um, all right, okay, yep, no, no, these are real orders, sorry. I was just had to check them. Okay, a real order from a case, order 10. Each party is restrained from smoking in the child's presence and will do all acts and things necessary to remove the child from the presence of anyone else doing so. Order 13. Each party is restrained from making any negative, derogatory or denigrating comments about the other or their partners or family members to or in the presence or hearing of the child and will do all acts and things necessary to remove the child from the presence of anyone else doing so. But these are specific orders for a specific case. So essentially, I'm, I'm not sure if what's happening when I click it, what's going to say? Uh, Okay, this means as long as you don't separate, you are free to blow smoke in your child's face while you tell them their mum or dad and their whole family are not very good. So, parental responsibility should not be only when a couple is separating. Parents have a responsibility to put the best interests and welfare of their child at the forefront. Whether or not you are divorced, you should not be blowing smoke in your child's face. Even if you live together, you and you know, are you know, married, whether it's happily or not, you should not be calling your partner an a-hole in front of the children. Sorry, I was just saying if, <laughs> if that was my husband pulling up, he's not an a-hole. Okay, so you can talk about parental um, responsibility not only in terms of separating couples but also you know within a normal family unit okay I think yep that is it so next week we are is week 10 last week of time not that you'd notice because we're locked down so next week we will be looking at the last two of our contemporary issues so we're going to look at surrogacy 
and birth technologies and care and protection of children. So it will only be one video, yeah, only one video next week. And you do have your HSC revision booklet that you will be able to look at next week. Of course, of course we're back face to face. Who knows? Life's a funny thing. All right. Happy trails, guys. Hope you had an enjoyable Father's Day. And if you don't like or don't talk to your father or don't have one, I hope you had a nice day yourself. Or I hope that you did nice things for those people who do help you and look after you. All right.